Welcome back, everyone. So we are on episode five of Placement Series for Physio Students, bringing you educators who are in the field, practicing, talking about their area. And um, today I've brought back to the channel Andrew McCauley, and I'm going to get Andrew to introduce himself, but we're going to be talking about MSK practice. We're going to be talking about how you can prepare. We're going to be talking about what you might expect on those placements and also how you can get the most out of them. So welcome back to the channel, Andrew. Can you tell us just a little bit briefly about your kind of current role and why students might want to, to listen to this today? Yeah, thanks, James, or the physio on steroids, as I oh, classed you yeah. before. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm a physio for about 20 years. Uh, and did sports science before that, but uh, uh, yes, physio about 20 years, most of that's been MSK, pretty much 18 years, uh, London first, down in Cornwall now, and I split my time between um, the NHS and private practice, so I have uh, Monday to Wednesday, I do uh, ESP clinics in hip, knees and shoulders, and then generally, well, depending on COVID, but generally in the afternoons, I'll rehab patients as well. Um, taken on obviously your normal physio duties there and obviously you've had lots of experience with students um, but most of all I was one which I think is the most important thing um, uh, with this talk and then um, three days um, in private practice where uh, I deal with you know a, a mixture of people but a very much goal and sport orientated um, uh, patients so I, I see a wide variety um, I did a lot of clinical education uh, with students for a long time. Now I still take up a little bit. I don't necessarily take the direct role on anymore, but I certainly like we have students at the moment and they'll come in and observe. I really like teaching students actually um, because I think we can really improve on it. And I think we, you know, whatever about the unis, but the physios out in the practice are the, are the key to the future of the role of the profession really. So I think, um, I think we can really add to somebody being excited by the profession um quite early on you know ah. so obviously msk you'd i think you'd argue that the majority of the public and i think students going into physio i know i did it's a perception that that's all physio is um so it's, it's a big a uh, big chunk so i think we as students you know as have been a student kind of have an idea to to a certain extent what we might kind of expect but it's about going on placement and thinking about actually, well, what sort of things would your educators expect of you and, and things you might be doing? So the first kind of area we want to kind of broach today is about how you prepare for it. So, you, you know, for students who are, who've got an MSK placement coming up and they're thinking, what do I need to do? What do I need to know? And how can I best prepare for it? What are your kind of top tips, Andrew, in terms of, in terms of that? Yeah, that's a great question, really, because it's, well, I tell you what, I asked the student today because I had a, I had my thoughts on this from my own experience. Um, and I uh, and I thought, well, I'll just double check now. I'm not out of the date here with this and oh, what they were feeling um, rather than saying what I felt 20 years ago. But and she said to me, the student was it was great. She knows you, actually. I think she spent a placement with you. She was positive about you as well, Jane. Um, and she said um, she said, I said, what, what, what were you feeling coming into the placement? And she was like. That I needed to know all the pathologies, and it, you know that's what she she was really she was like I, I just needed to know it all, and it was like I need to know all of the physio. <laughs> that's what came into my head. It's like I need to, and I was like, wow, that's a lot of pressure. And I just went, that's pretty stressful. She said I was stressed out of my mind, you know. And then I was like, so so what happens then in the first week? And she said, well, I went home and I was absolutely stressed out of my mind when I went home that that first Monday. So she comes in thinking she needs to know about arthritis, about tendinopathy, about all these like conditions that are you know I'm still learning about now uh, on her first day of a student placement in MSK first first day and I'm like right so the, the the key thing is as a student is that that definitely is not what you need to do on day one okay. I, I think I think the key thing is is actually day one is opening up good communication with your tutor straight away and there's like are the educator now there's, a, there's nearly a talk for an educator and a student, but really the educator is also possibly a little bit anxious and stressed as well. It might be the first time taking students. It might be that it increases their workload, et cetera. So from the student's point of view, is it's just open that communication of what did they expect in those first few days? Straight up, well, you know, because every educator might be slightly different. Now, for me, my tip is the best thing you can do, and it, and it crosses all over any joints, is 
just know a good subjective questioning and practice it the weekend before the week before saying the questions out to people asking about stuff which sounds mad but communication language is is a skill and the more you say it out loud and just repeating that question and, and then when you get the answers back or think about what those answers then would mean because what what chloe said to me the student was saying is like she was saying because she went in thinking she needed to know all the pathologies when she went into her subjective which she a week later now realizes that was the most important thing interestingly <laughs> said when I went to ask the questions, I'm thinking about the pathologies already and I'm stressing out of my mind. So she's, uh, you know, when do you get the pain? And she's going, oh God, and it, 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 the answers are coming back and she's thinking, oh, it's osteoarthritis. What am I going to do about that? I don't know anything about osteoarthritis. So she was getting nearly worked up before. Actually, the key thing was, was just to sit there, ask the questions and actually just maybe connect with that patient, and just and empathize and listen for those things and, and really understand what those questions meant. And, all if once you gather that information, you can come out and just say, "Look, I'll come back, have a chat with your tutor." Right? That's the that's the back to the conversation you want to have on your first day with your tutor. Look, I just want what what are the main things I need to do in this first week, like a short term goal. And I just think communication subjective is absolutely the the essential thing, and practicing it, and then at least with the tutor goes, okay, well we're just going to work on that for the first week. There's no pressure on the tutor then to kind of go, All right, well. They don't know their objective. They don't know they're this because it's usually four to six weeks anyway. So there's plenty of time for that. Mm -hmm. So I think it's just it's de-stressing because I think if you're when I was a student, stress, it just, it just made me th just think I couldn't think I think straight mm -hmm. and, I, and, I, and I couldn't rationalize. I, I'm sure everyone can relate to that. So if you're thinking you need to know lots of stuff, I think hone it right down. There's plenty of time for that. Yeah, definitely. And would you say, I mean, you could you could even ask that question before in your, your your email to to introduce yourself to your educator before you even arrive on that first day and just say sort of, and ask those questions and be kind of yeah and like some educators may actually not not know the answers either you know that's the other thing so, so be the you know take responsibility for your learning you know just kind of say look i've, I've been on plate you've been on placements and maybe you haven't but if you have been on placements you're not going to go and just dictate to think well well, what's going to make me feel comfortable? The first, well, like I'm saying here, the most important throughout your whole, if you do MSK after you qualify, the most important thing, I've never heard anyone say any different between any kind of MSK practitioner, right up to surgeon or not up to surgeon, but across to surgeon, back over to us at rehab, is that subjective is the most important thing and it drives everything. Yeah. And what also, what happens as well is subjective, you can, is where your bias will live. And that's where you will go down things where I will always say to students, listen to the mechanisms of how they get their symptoms. And it has to make some sense now. You can't just start linking things together because some of the information is nice and cushy and it, it feels like that. But actually, wait a minute, there's symptoms over here. And wait, what would have caused that? What was the change? And sometimes you find it hard to find a mechanism or patient, the patient finds it difficult to explain what happened. But that's the beauty of communication and listening, to be able to tease that out of them and to be able to get questions. Uh, and, and the better you get at that, obviously, the better you are at teasing out the answers. So I'm not saying you have to be perfect at it, but that is when you see an expert clinician or somebody who's been doing it for a while, they ask questions and you think, oh, well, how do they know to ask that question? Yeah. And the only reason they did that is because they've, they, they've done it before and they know where to go. But as a student, all you just want to do is be able to kind of say, right, ask the question, understand what that means. And then when you get the information, you will have time then to plan objective and you'll be able to bluff your way through an objective anyway. You, know, you don't, don't worry about messing that up, just bluff it. Because that's another skill. <laughs> just to, you know, like move your neck or lift your arms in the air. Or, oh yeah, that's, and you might have no idea what any of this means. You know, you're thinking, oh, what tests will I do? And, oh, is it sore, is that this or that? Doesn't matter. As long as you've got the questions and when you come out subjectively, you can then go, well, actually, I'm not quite sure what's happening, but this is my this is my theory. Now, that to an educator, if you were telling me that, I'm thinking you're getting top marks in your first day if you're doing that. You, I'm like going, I've got a good student here, someone who's who's actually breaking a massive component, which is an MSK assessment, down into the, the initial bit. And then we can start to build on that later on down there. Because because language and communication is the thing you're, that, that's the, you know, it's like anyone presenting, like I teach a course and stuff. And 
the first time you do it, you, you're just not comfortable. And so even talking to patients, it's not comfortable. And after week one, week two, you feel better at it. But I think to, to get, to get up, up straight off the bat, that's what you need to work on. Just communicating with your patients, just talking to them, asking them their name, being as kind of close to you as a person as possible, which I, I often find that a problem where you, you feel like you have to be a bit hyper professional mm. and a bit like, you know, you, you can't have some sort of, you can still, you know, your body language is a bit stiff. You feel a little bit like you're, you know, that they don't really believe you because you might be a student. So you just kind of think, well, wait a minute, you know a lot more than they do, first of all. So patients are desperate to find out. So you can just sit there and relax and, and listen to them. And then I suppose at the end of the day, if you don't have any, if you don't know what to do with that information, that's why you got an educator. And, the, and by week two, week three, that will get easier. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I don't know if that makes sense, James. Yeah, no, definitely. You know. we, we, we've, we've kind of covered loads there and just kind of reiterated some of that. So preparing to go on patient, one of the best things you can do is, <clears throat> is practice that subjective uh, of history taking. And, uh, you know, say, you know, you've got, you can talk to the wall, the dog, your flatmates, yep. and just say, right, okay, they've got a knee, they've got a knee problem. It doesn't have to be specific. And say, right, what are you going to ask them? And then ask them and then practice those questions of, of that history, yeah. the mechanism, ags, eases, and talk about 24 hour history and patterns and yeah. their concerns and, and all those sorts of things. And just, as you say, verbalize it. Yeah. And like, if you, if you ask, yeah, that, that exactly, James, thanks for, for that. It, it's that kind of like, right. So when you do ask the questions, then, then it's like, what's that telling me? You know, they're getting night pain. Okay. So what, what might night pain be? and have your different answers to that and you won't they, they may not be clear either you know a night pain can be caused by many things but it's like but also what it tells you is they're not sleeping very well they're irritable and mm-hmm. um, maybe w- w- what am i going to do in my assessment am i going to really stir things up right now or maybe i'll go kind of easier with certain things or even in the in the treatment side of things they, don't, they haven't slept for three weeks properly so I, 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 is your central nervous system going to be wound up when someone's not sleeping? So again, when it comes to exercise prescription, you're already thinking down the line, well, how much are they going to be able to handle it? Do, do I just need to give them advice and education about maybe what's wrong with them? So that's maybe coming on a little bit advanced, but just every time you ask a question, that, that's what I didn't do well. I, I just asked the questions, vomited out a bunch of questions and then really didn't. I, I was like, what does that tell me? You know, what, when they have stiffness or when they have pain or 24 hour pattern, like you mentioned, what are these telling me? Is this a rheumatological inflammatory problem? Is that something that might come into why you're asking these questions? So, mm-hmm. so yeah. So, it, it, if anything, if you're going to prepare, that's all I would do. Okay. I wouldn't go looking up because you've got time then. If you've nailed that down in the first week, I, I, most joints, again, as you say to you, they'll have similar kind of, it's the same stuff. You know, there's certain specific questions you might ask, of course, like red flag stuff, but generally they're even fairly similar as well. You know, I think we get a little bit too, you know, you don't have to be an expert as a student on your first placement. That's the key. And you're not going to, you're not going to do anything too ma- major in those first few weeks. Like if in week six, you're not asking spinal red flags for a spinal patient, yeah, you you know, that's a problem, but not in week one or week two, if you don't get it right or you don't say it perfect in the first thing. If, but if you're nice and relaxed and, and getting used to talking to patients, trust me that the other bit comes easier. Just kind of, yeah. I, and I think that that comes from being honest with your tutor from the beginning. It's just like, look, I'm, I'm just, this is what I'm going to try and do my first week. My goal is to try and really be good with my communication. Now, if any tutor doesn't say that's a good thing, then, you know, I'd be I'd be, you know, I'd be a bit surprised. Yeah, definitely. So I, I can't, with, with preparing for an MSK placement, we can't not cover the absolute obvious one that we hear all of the time. So can you confirm to us and to the students out there, when you go on your MSK placement, do you need to know all of your anatomy? And do you need to know all your muscles, origins, insertions, nerve roots? Do we need to know all of that off by heart? You need to know all of that off by heart, James, every single bit of it and all the uh, neuro brain anatomy as well. I, I, if, if you don't know that, then I think you're, yeah, no, you don't, you don't know is the He's simple answer. He's very, it's a really bad joke. And um, yeah, no, no, it, yeah, no, it's a great one. It's a good, it's, it's, I wish I had this stuff when I was, because um, that's what you kind of think because, mm. it, you know, 
but it, again, this is it's it, it's part of your MSK experience of that you have to. There's some stuff like there's no way I remember any of that, and I have to keep going back over joints that I see, and then I'm like, oh yeah. Sometimes you get caught in a rut, and you'll go down one, and you'll you'll see stuff quite a lot, and then you're like, oh god, I completely forgot about that particular type of pathology, or the, the, or that anatomy, and then I go on a course and I get reminded. But that's why it's continued professional development. It's, yeah. it's always changing a little bit. So anatomy is important, but again, you're not going to be you know there and then on the spot. Certainly as a student, anyway, you're not. Gonna, it's not going to be like, oh yeah, right, I need to know the origin insertion, etc. You, you just don't need to know that. I, in my opinion, I think it, I think if you do know it, they're brilliant, but it's it's certainly not. Again, it comes back to what I said at the beginning. That's the most important thing, so especially a, for placement. A good awareness of of kind of your muscle actions, maybe quite a good one, or what they do to a certain extent. Yeah, yeah, like it's yeah, like I, I, it's kind of it's a good, it's a really good question. I'm just trying to think about me. I suppose it's difficult sometimes when you've been in it a long time, but like how much. Yeah. You, you gotta you gotta have a like i suppose because because they're loaded with so much information coming out of um out of uni there's so much going on there the last thing you need to do is kind of just fit any more into an overflowing cup so what i'm trying to say is like on the first week no one's going to be like they might okay some tutors might ask you about that i think that would be a bit mean like well, where does that insert and attach i i, th- I just think there's a time and a place for for knowing that detail, yeah. and I don't know if that would be a way I would teach a student. You know, I, I I would teach them more about movements, and I would teach them more about patterns, and teaching them about communication and 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 understanding patients. I think that is my, what I would do in the first couple of weeks, and then yes, of course, then learn it more when you go into the assessment. Then the anatomy comes, but you're I'm thinking that's going to happen more later in the placement, to be honest. Right. That's my opinion, though, James. You know, sometimes mm-hmm. other 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 shooters might have a different experience, but from what I know about communication and and learning, is that putting people under a stress is 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 really the opposite of a, an environment where people learn. You know, definitely. I think just to throw my two pen, two pence worth in from from yep. my experience as a as a student and on placement is absolutely you don't need to know your anatomy inside out off by heart. I think it's it's quite helpful to have a good awareness of 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 the muscles there and and as much as you can. But it's, as you said, that it's not something to suddenly stress yourself out with prior to going on placement. Um, you know, you are at your stage of where you are in your course. You'll have covered what you've covered, and if, you know that that's kind of where you need to be. Um, and your educator's not yeah, going to be in your third year when you're in your first year. And, and that's the thing is, like as you said to you, the first thing what you're going to do on placement is like you come in. And then if, the first thing you have to do is the whole point you've been there is to see a patient. Yeah. Is to have that experience to actually. So, and, the, and the, the first thing you do there is, is talk to them and ask them questions. So guess what? That's probably the best place to start. Like when it comes to anatomy, if you're a bit rusty on it, and I certainly wasn't the best at all on it, I would just go and think, just think maybe in the evenings and we'll maybe come back to that later in some of the questions, but like, how do you focus on things? And if that's relevant, um, but it often is doesn't need that yeah absolute um, specificity. Mm, so we're looking at there's there's other things that that subjective and that talking and feeling comfortable, you know that's is going to get you further in your in your assessment as you know, as we know um, down the line. So preparation we've hit a few key things there. I think that's that's great and some things that probably I know is when I was preparing for my MSK placement the things that I probably wouldn't have necessarily prioritised. So that's great and I, and I would concur that they're things that, that do help massively massively i know and you do start with subjective when you're doing your placements it's your first msk placement i know mine was it was week one we're just going to try and nail your subjective assessment coming away from that subjective to your educator and say well, what have you found out what have you heard from your patient what have you listened to and and as you say as you're going in there by de-stressing yourself and thinking that's the goal and that's what I'm going to say to my tutor that I'm going to focus on the tutor can then agree you can kind of agree that yeah because like as, as I'm speaking to the students student uh, educators and and I was saying and they were like oh yeah because we actually planned the six-week goals like the end you yeah. know rather than like let's do three days five days what's the what's the focus here yeah you know let's do that and she was like oh yeah I wish we'd done that 
And he's like, yeah, well, that's all right. But she, like, again, it's, this, is, this is where you get a good educator there who's open and honest about, oh, right, great, I'll do that next time. Because as an educator, should really be creating an environment for a student to feel relaxed. That's, you know, but that comes down to the educator. But I think if a student's proactive with regards to how they learn and, and, and what they want to get out of those first week, that's key. And there's nothing wrong with being like that. I think someone would be like, wow, that's cool. This is a, this is a proactive student. This is going to make this placement easier. It's not, you, you can always tell in that first day what, what, the, what the student's going to be like. And if they're like that already, you're just thinking, Grant, this is going to be good. You get a good positive vibe off the tutor and it will probably go better. Just like any first impression. And yeah, just so, like the first impression with your patient as well. <laughs> 100%. Same thing, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So we've, we've covered a few things there. So that obviously the next stage we go on to is what to expect on placement. Um, and we've already covered a few things in terms of, of some of the things in terms of seeing patients. And, and this is sometimes, I think, the bit that makes a lot of, well, life experiences more scary is, is the unknown. If we don't really know what we're going to expect or what we're going to encounter, it can be quite nerve wracking. So what sort of things can you tell us that you that a student might expect to see or and do on, a, on an MSK placement? Yeah, yeah, I kind of came out of a different answer, but I, I think I'll answer a question that that just that's a, it's that's when you clarified or something there that I think I'll go through. So like you, usually day one, it's you, you come in in the morning and you meet your tutors, and then you go through some um, some kind of basics around the department and stuff like that. It's all quite chilled out, and maybe you might do some observation depending on what year you're in with 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 the physios. You might go in with a patient and 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 let them do an assessment. I think that's quite quite standard still. Mm. And then they may have patients booked in for you. There's usually like plenty of time. Um, there's usually one, maybe two. That That's kind of, I would say that's quite normal for you to know. So that's why I'm saying if you're going to go in there and kind of going, right, I'm happy with my subject. If you kind of, you don't have to worry too much about that patient. You can ask some good questions. And if I go in and, and straight away, the student's kind of fairly relaxed and, 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 and relaxed with the guys to asking questions. I'm like, oh, great. It's a positive thing. So so that's what you're kind of looking at. And then after that, they'll usually, you know, there's a, there's a diary. So every evening uh, as well at the end, so if people are nervous about what might happen, you, you'll know what you're going to see the next day. Yeah. So like what, what's useful, I would find, um, again, what I would find is always check what was happening the next day, what patients have we got in. So you can get, a, get an idea of the joints that you're going to be seeing. So if you were nervous about what joints you're going to see, have a little look, then you can, and, and it kind of ties into some of the, some of the nuggets, I suppose I might as well mention it now, is that a lot of physios that part of what to expect is you're going to be absolutely exhausted. And I know that I was kind of I was kind of reluctant to say kind of things like exhausted and stressed and overwhelmed. But I think if you kind of go in there and think, look, it's, it, it's not that surprising that you will be shattered by the end of the first day. You have to pretend smile all day. <laughs> I was my, you know, you, you just, you know, you're always listening. And then it's like you have to you're meeting loads of people. It's, it's really tough. So don't don't be too, don't beat yourself up either on on the fact that you probably go home and just day one you might just crash yeah. and be very very overwhelmed with it. And that thing is, you just have a word with yourself about that. I think that's the key. Is that don't be surprised that happens to everyone. So when you come in, um, some then a lot of people physios are perfectionists by nature. A lot of a lot of them have that similar trait, and they try and go home. And then some people really like try and do more work, and they're just exhausted. They need to probably maybe just have an idea what they're going to do the next day. And uh, my first advice as well is to kind of um, no longer than a half, maybe 45 to 60 minutes of kind of work in the evening. And I would go focused. So I would really kind of, you know, don't try and just learn about a big pathology, try to think, well, what do I need to know tomorrow that's going to be the, the most useful? And nearly even prioritize it in the first 20 minutes because you might start reading, doing stuff and your head might be just like, oh God, this is too much. So really focus your learning in the evening. Sometimes if you're not a great reader, have a podcast lined up. And if you don't know, ask your tutors, what, what would be useful? You think, yeah. um, again, this is where the proactivity as a student is really useful. You don't have to be busy, you know, <laughs> you know, oh, what can I do? And there's proactive and then there's busy, if you know what I'm saying. You know, to be, don't be just like, you know, Mr. Key, Mr. and Mrs. Kane, but you can just kind of say, look, I'm, I'm actually quite tired, but is there anything you'd recommend I would listen to that might help? Yeah, because again, you, you, that's quite a genuine, and I, I would be a listener rather than a reader. So, I think those kind of things could be useful with focusing in your uh, when you're even uh, or when you go home in the evening and stuff, and and not to feel that like you have to learn everything. 
because you, your your brain will not be able to cope. So it's 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 science. <laughs> you can't take any more in. Yeah. So stuffing it in there, you're just going to get stressed out of your mind, not sleep very well, and then grand. So go for a walk if you're into exercise. I would I would recommend this, which sounds real daft, but get out and do get get your head clear and be surprised how good. Like there's some good research with regards to uh, learning, certainly from skill acquisition, is that. And they've done this with sleep and co-sleep. So you could be really crap at something like, I don't know, you're trying to learn the piano. I think specifically they did some of the studies in piano. Um, and um, the, the, you can't get the particular track or whatever you're trying to learn. Um, but when you wake up the next day, because your brain's um, recovered, they actually can, the skill has improved. So they, they, they found that quite a lot in studies. And then they, uh, they stopped people sleeping and then the skill wouldn't improve. And then they got them to sleep and their skill improved again so sleep actually helps significantly with what you'd learned the day before so kind of understanding that freaking out the night before is 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 not going to help the situation what it's likely to be is you're going to mm -hmm. absorb all that information you've had that night and i know that seems a little bit like oh oh yeah sure it's going to but it will do it, it's just it's they've, they've shown it all time and time and time again so going out there enjoying your evening and do it maybe a little bit of kind of some specific stuff go get some exercise if possible and and get and get yourself to sleep you know what i mean i, I don't know that sounds really like i'm, I'm a, a parent um but I, I think that's key it's nice. um yeah, definitely. It's, it's hard to do man it's hard to do i think people will still think it's no i'm going to stay up for two three hours and then they do the fake learning where they you know they're just with it I've, i used to see it when we were on placements as well and you know some some of the physios I, students I was with and they're like they're not reading it they're just got it there but they're, nothing's going in and it's just like nearly they're they're satisfying a stress you know their own stress they're, oh well I am working but they're not it's not going in mm -hmm. so you know give, give yourself a break when it comes to that that's what I would that would say and keep it focused like you said there you know make it focused as well so you're not you know you're not just aimlessly trying to look like you're doing lots or feel like you're doing lots actually take get yeah. something that's good solid that you can go into the next day and say i learned this i looked at this and i'm using it the next day and, and you know you know you said like that's what clinical educators you have to make it like i'm not a big marks fan i've said this on the last youtube thing we did you know um that marks don't mean anything um in degrees even like as long as you pass your degree but to be honest i've said before i've seen really good people get first i've seen really good people get thirds or whatever you call it two twos and stuff it we never look at it in interviews we we certainly don't care what you got in your placement marks that doesn't even come to that we don't even look at your degree mark really um so so placement marks so it, you, you gotta just chill on the mark anxiety as well like mm -hmm. it's always everyone likes to be praised everyone likes to do well but just give yourself a break on that on chasing a mark because what you but if you are interested in marks it's that kind of proactivity that's that kind of like taking that small thing and then when the tutors see you then come back and then perform it well or you know learn from your thing from your mistake if you want to call it or learn from what you that's the most easy way to kind of give a tutor going well yeah well that's that's better <laughs> make it obvious you know what i mean not like oh look what i've done but it more it, it'll just come out because you'll just be like oh yeah and and, and I and you can have those chats with the educator. So again, just kind of going, yeah, actually, I found it really useful when I did that. That's what you want to be doing. You want to be your conversations with educators. Don't have you, you don't have to be. It's that balance between being busy and a, and a, I suppose you call a suck up versus kind of just like, yeah, I'm, I, I'm actually genuinely interested in learning here. That genuine interest in learning, rather than I, I think at times I was, I was just saying what I thought they needed to hear. Yeah, because can. again, it, I didn't know that marks didn't matter, and I thought it was the be all and end all, mm -hmm. and I, it 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 could it ruined some placements, you know. And then when you didn't get the mark, and then someone else got a higher mark, you know, like they're a clan, you know, it just brings in a whole like, what the fuck, you know? How did they went that in placement? And you can know how they, and then you get all the ego comes in, and it, it ruins it really. Yeah. So I, I would just say, just go in there and have that kind of real thirst, you know, that thirst sounds really a bit lame, but yeah, that that interest in learning you know i think that comes across and it's genuine as well is it yeah i think it's if you if you've got an interest in learning rather than an interest in pleasing you're going to have a much better outcome that's it i like that yeah um, so i think yeah. um, no, that, that's great so in terms of um the kind of patients that you might see as as a student yeah um 
I mean, how how complex are some of the patients that you know students might see? Because I think this is another thing with MSK. Because sometimes it can be quite daunting, really, because you've got people with injuries and pathologies and things that masquerade as other things. You've got silly things that we might think of. You know, what if I miss someone with quadriquine or some spinal? You know, they yeah. scare so, students. Yeah, no, yeah, no. It's a great question, uh, James. From the point of view of yeah, I, again, I just look back to when I was a student and that, that that's such a good question because all of that doesn't matter. You're a student. It doesn't matter in those first few weeks. You you don't, you know, call the you're not going to miss anything. That's why you got a you got a tutor with you. Yeah. That's the thing. Or and if you do miss it, you'll never miss it again. Mm. Like some of the uh, some of the things that you know it's on week five, week six, and you're saying doing the same mistakes, you're not asking the same questions that you know the tutor said to you, you missed that before. That's when you need to be, that's a problem. Mm. But like in those first two, three weeks, be crap. It's yeah. grand. Yeah. Yeah. You learn from the, the crapper you are. And then you're really good in week five. They're going to be like, oh my God, this physio is unbelievable. The students are unbelievable. And they'll, they'll be like, oh, amazing, amazing, amazing. You know, because it's that. So like the best time is not to, like I always say, is fail when you're crap at stuff, you know, and, and you don't need to. That's the thing is you're going to see all sorts. You see joint pain. You see really um, obvious stuff post op. They've had a hip replacement. Yeah. Okay, uh, you'll have people who maybe have t- twenty years of persistent lower back pain, persistent shoulder pain, neck pain, stuff like that, which are trickier sometimes. But again, that's where the subjective comes down to. Of I always, I, I physios now doesn't matter what are thirty years qualified who come on my course, and I'm like going. You've got to literally enjoy those patients that are hard. They've got that tricky, long, you know, and that's the ones you got to listen to more and find an interest in their story. Yeah. So you develop that empathy for them. And then you can start, because often the time is if you try and fix them too quick or you interrupt them too quick, they don't want that. They, they, they want to get out what they're feeling and asking actually, you know, when, when um, just on that point, I suppose, when patients start talking about what they've been told by other clinicians, including doctors or physios, A very good question I would say to ask as well is that, well, how does that make you feel when they say those things? How does it make you feel when they say you've got osteoarthritis? Because you'll get real insights in what the patient thinks is happening to their body. Mm -hmm. So then like if they think, let's just take a really obvious one. If they think when they bend over a disc bulge is going to push into their nerve and give them leg pain, or if they uh, are walking, their knee is I would say like crumbling or it's going to wear away because that's what they've been told is happening, wear and tear. If they feel that's happening, then you've already got some, and if someone's got a really acute knee, like really sore and they're saying, and they believe that they're wearing it away and your treatment is exercise perhaps, or modification of load, then you can already start going as I need to go down an education route with this person. They don't really understand. So I've kind of gone off on a slight side tangent there, but it's, it's just important that that's why you have to listen to what they feel about, and it gives them time to be able to tell you that story. So even with those ones who come in, like what I used to dread as a student and then even into physio as a being a qualified physio was those ones who go, oh, I've got back pain, shoulder pain, elbow pain, and I've got knee pain. And by the way, and, and you're like, oh, Jesus, how am I going to assess all this now? You know what I mean? That's what's going through your head. You're like, oh, I mean, I've, got, I've got, you know, time's running out here. So you, so what you have to then is sit down and kind of go, all right, well, they've got multiple things going on here. So that there's, there's a couple of things that might, you know, don't panic on assessing everything. I would always say, you know what, sit back and listen to that. What's going on here? What have they seen? Who have they been to? They've got multiple joint pain, right? Okay. Have they had tests? That They're the ones you need to listen to. So don't panic when they say they have multiple joint pain. Just have a listen. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I know that sounds really... Um, uh, easy to say it, but and, and whether to do it or not, but like versus somebody comes in and says, is that a total knee replacement or an operation or is clearly um, turned and twisted their knee or ankle, uh, then then the, the subjective is less less complicated with regards to mechanisms and stuff, and you can maybe speed it up a little bit. But certainly with those complicated ones where people say they're complicated, but actually they just they might just need to actually think, well, why have they got all these joint pain? Is this something to do with poor pain management belief systems um etc so uh yeah you you can see uh, probably going off on tangents there so i i would say that you you see a good mixture of people who just get insidious onset of shoulder pain for example 
mm-hmm. uh, you know, they've just been doing something or uh, they don't remember why it's happened. You know, you, you, you'll get you'll get histories like this. And, and again, like with everything, you, you've got to you've got to sit back and uh, and make mistakes and, and not have a clue what they're on about. But at least, you know, if you can speak to them and have a good rapport communication with them, that patient's going to be all right with you. Like, even if you have no idea what's wrong, they're going to give you a bit of a wide berth. They know you're a student. Patients aren't mean. English people aren't mean. You know what I mean? They're quite, you know, even if they're thinking in the head, like, oh, they may not know what's going on here. But they know there's a tutor there and they will they will give you time. It's very rare that I ever see a patient be really mean to a student. They're, they're, they just don't. Right. So you've got time, and if and if you're just friendly, they often kind of go, "Oh, best of luck with your, you know, yeah. with everything." They're actually quite supportive patients. Really? So so don't be too don't be too freaked out by it. They're actually quite, you know, people are generally understand when someone's under pressure. You know, you get it when you know you know someone's at a checkout. And they're like they're getting taught how to put stuff through. You know, you don't like, oh come on, I'm late. Like, you know, oh god, you know, you're taking ages. You, you you give people a bit of time. You know, they're learning. So the same patients do the same. It's definitely kind of a couple of things you you touch on there as well, and it, you know I know we're going kind of around about, but it does I think it's great. But really, really good tip there. You know, you may not know what's going on, but some of the most important treatments you can do for patients is reassurance and and education. And so you might have a presentation, you're not really sure what's going on, but in your assessment, you're going to clear anything serious. You're going to do your red flags. You're going to know it's something serious, and then relaying some of that reassurance to a patient. I, I've, I mean, for experience, sometimes that has been the, the most effective um, uh, treatment that you've, that you've given. So you don't always have to have the answer for that specific problem, but actually giving them reassurance that it's not something in their heads that they were really worried about. And that comes again from listening about their concerns and how it makes them feel when someone else has told them this, that and the other. And that's, so it's, it's not uh, always uh, what you think it is. I 100% agree with that. I, think, I, I think, to be honest, I don't know what the percentage is, but there's a high percentage of people that I think it's not the exercise or the treatment I've given them. Yeah. I think that might be a part of sometimes that people expect, patients expect you to do something. Mm-hmm. And that kind of just fills a, a, an expectation sometimes that, all oh, right, I've been to do. But the biggest thing was that you've reassured them that, oh, it's not this, it's not this. And even if you're not 100% sure, it's still they're going, all oh, right, great. Because if you've asked them what you're worried about, yeah. so what's, you know, I often I'd say, well, what do you think is going on? And, yeah. and, and I, they'll go, you know, so, like, I'll say, well, like, you, you've got, you said all that kind of stuff. Do you think there's anything, what do you think might be going on? Or and I know you're not a physio, but I just want to know what your take is on this. Mm-hmm. You'd be surprised how many times people kind of will come back with stuff. Like some people kind of go, oh, I really don't know. That's cool. But sometimes they come back with, well, actually, I've read this and, I know you're not supposed to look up Google. Patients get a bit embarrassed and they're like, oh, should... they're like, oh no, I Google. I Google shit all the time when it comes yeah. to medical stuff. You know, sometimes it's just like, oh yeah, right. And it's certainly around my kids and stuff. They're sick, I'm Googling like hell. So, you know, it's what you do with that information. And if they've, they might've come across some good stuff or it's not so good stuff. And then they're like, well, so that's made me worry that I might need this. And you'd be surprised then what the, so that, again, it comes down to just a, s- a simple question. What are you worried about? What are you concerned? So then, then therefore, your treatment is, like you said, the reassurance that, well, look, these are the reasons why I don't think that's the case. And these are the, and, and if it is the case, let's say sciatica, you can, if you know your research, now and you may not, this, I don't want to push it on with, you know, week one here, but if you know your research, well, look, there's a good chance that 70% of people, that you, your leg pain gets better. It, it goes away, you know, or frozen shoulders, like, oh, it's a really horrible condition, but look, there's an awful natural, a natural history here. Um, we'll definitely try to help you modify the pain and get better. But, you know, there's there's a good good chance that this is going to get better within the next 18 months. You know, you're not stuck with this frozen shoulder. Because, like, imagine you wake up with a shoulder that you cannot move and it's extremely painful. Mm-hmm. It has, I just can't imagine what that's like without knowing that what it is. You'd be freaking out, wouldn't you? You'd be exactly. like, and they might be six months down the line with this. I would be freaking out. So that idea that, oh, look, it's a frozen shoulder. And, and given that... And it, given that reassurance i think is yeah you're dead right it's 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 i think it's more powerful than a lot of stuff we do i think it's louis griffith's um quote um from cornwall he says it's a it's a bloody good painkiller reassurance it, it, and i think it just i'm just thinking now in my head it, it just goes exactly why i'm doing these videos because as i know as a student a lot of the time we fear and we're worried about placement is because we don't know what's going to happen so if you think about patients are just the same 
a lot of the fear and anxiety and worry that are yeah. behind injuries and pathologies is because the patients are unaware and unsure. You see it in acute as well. You know, patients are in bed and they're, they're worried and concerned. And, and we then know as well from the research what worry and concern and expectations can do for pain levels and all those sorts of stuff as well. So it, it's, it's really not to be underestimated. So, yeah, really important stuff. Yeah. Mm. So we, again, we've got our three things of what, um, how to prepare, what to expect, and then we've got how to make the most out of placement. And I think we're, we're kind of covering them all in, in one go. Yeah. Uh, I yeah. I'm going to throw it over to you. So in, in your, of the things that we were going to cover today, what sort of things have we not covered so far, Andrew? Things that you've kind of, we've got yeah, to I was going to, I was trying to have a think of just having a look at some of my notes there, because it was, yeah, sometimes you can um, as I say I'm a very big ranter. I think, I think being, uh, I was saying this to the educators as well. It's like, it's that, it's that little bit of proactivity. It's the same as a junior as well. I think I said it to you on my last interview as well. It's that, not, it's that fine line of not being busy, but like being really and it's simple stuff. Like I've seen students be cocky around admin staff. That's annoying. Mm. That's disrespectful. And it's kind of because I think it's because of anxiety. I think they get a bit worried uh, and, they, and they talk to them like they're not, because they're so focused on the patient or the tutor that they talk to the admin staff a little bit like that. So don't forget, like, you know, and I, I know this sounds really bad, but I, I have seen it and I think it's possibly, possibly true. So be respectful to everyone in the, you know, make an effort with conversation, you know, at lunches, and, you know, and stuff. Just just get to know other staff members and don't be afraid to, you know, I, that you'd be surprised. You're, you are part of the team then. Yeah. And I try as a, if I am in the department, that I try and make as, as relaxed as possible and when we're with patients and we're talking clinical yeah we can we can still have a we can still enjoy it it doesn't have to be it's a very just a, it's, it's a very open conversation but i think if you're a student just make it easy for people to talk to you you know just kind of you know simple simple icebreakers i know if some people aren't are a bit nervous about that but most people want to talk you no one's going to ignore you if you just say oh how's your day what's going on and you'd be surprised then how that may be just lead to something else. So that's it. That sounds like a really obvious thing, but it just doesn't get done, you know. Um, I think suggesting things as well, like suggest, so, you know, rather than as you said, we, we've touched on it before, asking questions for the sake of them. You don't, don't ask questions that are really going to, you, you know, so you get. I've had really intelligent, cocky students as well, so they try and be a little bit too smart to try and nearly impress somebody. Don't think, don't do that. You're just going to sound like a, a right dick. And at the end of the day, they have a job and you don't. So don't try and make someone feel small, even if you think, you know, something or what they said wasn't correct. I think there's get better at asking questions in a, in a respectful way. Mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, if that does that make sense? You know, just if you've got it and, and just don't ask questions for the sake of it. I think you just have a little think and, and just um, and then come back to it. Even if you kind of like I, I have them sit in and clinic sometimes. And if someone came back to me and says, oh, you know, when you did that with that patient, you just go through that again with me, but maybe like the next day or something. Yeah, yeah. I think that, I think that's, I think that's, you know, that's again, just sign of you've gone away, you've had a think um, and you, you've reflected and then you've come back and I think, and then you've come up with a good question. I, I think don't underestimate, again, communication within your department, you know, before you even get to patients, you know, that they're, they're the key things. Um, with exercise prescription, so when you're trying to prescribe exercise, less is more. Yeah. I, I, especially with the sedentary population, people. I'm not gonna, you know, don't wanna go on too long on that. I could talk all day about exercise prescription, but when it comes to like the simple thing is, is keep things. Don't try and give them five things when one will do. You know, especially if they, they're, you know, when it goes to adherence, patients aren't very good at it. So keep it simple, uh, you know, and and go after. It. And sometimes that's just advice and education and reassurance, like we talked about. Um. Do a, try and suggest if they don't do it on your placement, try and do and um, make sure you suggest that you do a presentation. And it probably is a reflection piece or on or on a topic that you found interesting and pick a topic you found it interesting. And when you do your PowerPoint presentation or whatever, you know, again, don't wait for the tutors to, to do that. That's that proactivity. Look, I'm going to do this. I'm going to go and do the thing. I'm, in week five, I'd really like to do a presentation. Even inside your head, you're going, I really don't want to do this. <laughs> now, it, it, you know what I mean? And, it, and it, 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 you know, some departments might get everyone in front. Don't, just say, oh, look, I'd rather just do it in front of, like, you know, the other student and yourself, if you don't mind, but I'd really like to do a presentation. You see, the educator will go, fine. 
you know, that's grand. Like some, some I, I've seen it before where educators are making do in front of the whole department. And that's horrible. Like, you know, I, I, I just think, and when you do a presentation, think about what it would be like to watch that presentation before you do it. Don't kill people by, you know, loads of words on the screen. Like this is an opportunity to get good at presenting. And that's something that I think is really important for physics. And I don't think it's, it's, it's probably done enough at undergraduate level where, you know, really good um, about how to present information to other therapists without boring the fuck out of them. <laughs> Sorry. Mm-hmm. <laughs> do, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Just like keep things simple um, and, and, always, and always ask opinions before you do it. Again, just look, I was thinking about doing these slides. Is that going to bore you? Because if someone came to me and told me, I thought that would be brilliant. I'd be like, yeah, that, that's, that's great. Even if it was boring, I'd be like going, yeah, well, at least you've, you've had the balls to come and say, I don't really, I've never done one. I don't know what to do. What do you think you'd recommend? Like, again, you're going to learn from that. And then the tutor's going to go, this, this person's on the ball here. Because yeah. there's no way we expect you to do a brilliant presentation. So if you come with that kind of, again, interest, not too keen, just suggesting things, that that's, you know, I could go and go and go here, James. But th- th- they're the kind of simple, look, it's just been like kind of, it's, it's communication, isn't it? It's back to that, just developing the relationship within the department, being a bit, being a bit, uh, being respectful and making sure that you nearly, you know, you're planning your learning journey with the tutor and the tutor's just going, okay, great, brilliant. They don't have to do very much. And I guarantee you that they'll, they'll like that. Yeah. No, good. Yeah. I mean, that's a, some good tips there. Eh? Definitely. Definitely. I think one of the, probably the common themes that's come out of this is, um, one, you and I are incapable of doing a short interview. <laughs> Short interview. <laughs> I tried. I really it's tried. It's better than the two hours that we had on the last one. Um, but it's it's all good stuff. And I'm going to put a link. I'll keep forgetting the um, interview that I did with Andrew beforehand. Uh, we did. Um, you might have to break that into chunks as well. That's a long one. <laughs> um, but also, it's keeping things simple. Um, and actually, the simple things are usually the most advanced and hardest to get right. Sometimes, actually, that like communication and stuff like that. Um, and it comes right back down to the last things you mentioned there, exercise prescription, keeping it simple and less is more quite often, less is more, um, and, and confidence into asking good questions, ask questions, don't ask them for the sake of it, ask them because you want to know the answer, that sort of stuff. That's yeah. Good. Yeah. It's just, it, it, like, as you said, simple is not easy. No, it's not. You know, it's, it's it, you know, and, and you, there'll be a part of your emotional brain that will be going, right, I need to know all this and I need to know. Trust me, you will not need to know all that stuff like we talked about with the anatomy. It's just it's the simple things that will actually you'd be surprised that tutors are like, well, this, this, is, this is what we're talking about. You can always go home and learn about the anatomy of the knee or uh, pathology. And, and what I'd say about pathologies, which I find useful even now, is, is you know, listening to a podcast where they actually talk about it because they'll give you a really good, broad kind of idea of what's currently happening. So... You know, that's the other thing is, you know, I don't know what physio students listen to, but certainly people like um, the PT inquest, which is Eric Mira. Now, he that's a good way if you want to look at how to do a journal club and like break it down journals. And 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 it's great when you hear experts also going, I didn't know what they were doing there or I'm not quite sure either. That's really helped me. I'm like, oh, Christ, I read that paper. I didn't know what was going on there. Um, and then same with uh, Adam Meekins is one. He does that a little bit more now as well. And he's actually gotten authors uh, of the papers, which again is really enlightening. So they've written the paper and then they've done it recently for the section trial and for uh, that is a real trial um, <laughs> before people think of being a bit weird and a few other papers as well. So it's great having researchers talking about the research and not being that. And even them going, look, we, we've got so much more questions to ask. It makes you feel, you know, because I think we always put people up on pedestals and stuff. And it's great mm. to hear these kind of people saying, look, we don't know the answer to this. So podcasts like it, that, that talk about stuff and pathologies. Um, obviously, Physio Matters is another really good one. Um, I just thought I'd mention a few of those. I can't remember. And then the Clinical Athlete podcast is useful. But I think the other three I mentioned are just useful for students, I think, um, mm-hmm. when it comes to like summarizing pathologies. Yeah, I think it's good. And as you said there, I think that's one really important thing. And hopefully educators will be sort of giving that message to students as well is no matter how far down the your experience and down your journey, you'll you won't know everything. Um and it's yeah. as, as I say, if you think if someone's 30 years qualified 
and they don't know everything and they don't always know the answer, why on earth should you know the answer in the first three years of your physio degree? It just doesn't make sense. I tell you, just because you said that, like I'll, I'll happily admit that a, a lot of mornings I'll wake up and be like, I'm going to get found out today. Yeah. I swear to God. Until I get in in the morning, and then you see the first, you know, and that still happens. I think that's healthy enough. I just, it keeps you yeah. on your toes. Yeah. It drives me a little bit like where I'm like, oh yeah, right. I need to, I need to, what, why am, why have I lost it? And it, it'll make me then go and listen to something, which then makes me feel better. Um, But that still happens. And all I've done differently that, because some students I think, oh my God, when's the stress going to go? It does go. It's, it becomes more comfortable. It's that comfortable with being uncomfortable, but it, it allows you to have, she then build on that knowledge and it actually the more you build on your knowledge it actually gets quite enjoyable at the start when you kind of don't know anything it's kind of like oh god i don't know anything mm-hmm. and then once you start building it up it becomes enjoyable that you can add to that yeah. but that's that kind of slight stress of just not knowing stuff is actually important for you to because it has to keep going and mm-hmm. if you listen to like you know joe gibson or any of those heads mm-hmm. like she's a great one for being very honest about so someone who's you know as, as, as brilliant she is It'll always be like she just thinks she's going to be found out like you know has that kind of like which pushes her to to, to go even more and um, that there's nothing wrong with that i think that i think that's nearly like i wouldn't say essential but i think it's it's part of progression so so don't feel like if you don't know anything god it, it still happens and it's um so don't, so, so get, you'll be grand you know <laughs> i think it's an irish saying you, you, you're going to be fine because that's part of it you got to nearly fall in love with learning a little bit which is, and you know, hopefully you pick the the right profession to do that. You know, no, you you hit the nail on the head. I always think that if you don't like learning, you're in the wrong job because <laughs> you're going to be doing it yeah. for the rest of your career, whether you like it or not. Uh, if you stop, we've well, got more questions than answers. You know, yeah, and that's science as well, isn't it? I mean, that's just yeah. the definition of science. Um, yeah. So no, that, that's fab, Andrew. Well, well, thank you so much for your time again. I think we've covered so so much. I really hope students have sort of listen through this, even if they have to break it down a little bit. Um, just to mention, obviously, we've done our previous interview before. I definitely recommend kind of looking at that, you know, the link's been on before. Um, and also for those people who sort of, I think, third years and maybe graduating, potentially, the course that you do as well, you're unraveling strength and conditioning. I think I, you know, I, you know personally from doing some stuff with you before, I think it's a good one to mention because I think it might well be quite useful for people to look out for. Yeah, yeah. It's on HDPN or Encore. Uh, they're the two companies who, who run it. Um, it's all around the country. It's getting hopefully face to face. I'm doing a couple this month, and um, uh, yeah, it's, it's it's I've had students on it. I've had doctors. I've had uh, non physios. Uh, it's it's not just about strength and condition. It's how to incorporate the principles into rehab. Um, big components on behavior change, adherence, compliance. How to get patients to kind of hopefully commit to what we want them to commit, and 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 change that that's that side of it as well. It's not just about lifting weights, but we do lift weights too. Uh, yeah I, I would definitely recommend having checking that out it's definitely i think maybe I'm, I'm a big believer in first and second years not overloading themselves with with loads of extra yeah. stuff but i certainly think for a third year and new grads i think it'd be something that would really benefit in terms of exercise prescription and, yeah. and patient interaction as well so i think that'd be fab as well amazing cool. brilliant andrew well thank you so much for your time again and um i'm no doubt we'll have another another um interview again i'm sure it'll be just as interesting as kind of normal. <laughs> yeah, nice one. Thanks, Jim. Cool. All right. Cheers, Angie. Cheers.